Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Microbiological Pathogens and Host Immune Response. I am Robert Castellanos of Labyrinths, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Kyogen. Whether your passion for answers takes you to a laboratory bench or a hospital bedside, the pursuit often begins with a blood or tissue sample, the deepest mysteries of disease and other biological processes. The answers you seek are encoded in the building blocks of life, DNA. Yet the work of learning what these molecules can tell you is quite a journey, and we at Kyogen understand the challenges associated with this quest. Our commitment is to enable you to quickly, reliably research your goal of useful, actionable insights. To this end, Kyogen offers you innovative solutions that cover every single step along this journey, not just technologies, but bridges from samples to insights. Samples to Insight means Kyogen offers you the industry's most reliable sample technologies because sample matters to your success. Our top quality assays and panels enable you to accurately analyze and identify diseases and genetic variations. Our bioinformatics software and cured knowledge bases transform your raw data into relevant, actionable findings. And our automation solutions provide you seamless and cost-effective workflows sample to insights. The insights you gain may lead to one small step or a giant leap forward for science and healthcare. Partnering with Kyogen for your work can make a difference. For more information, please visit kyogen.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problems through the green Q&A button lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would like to now introduce you to today's speaker, Krishnan Alampalam. Dr. Krishnan Alampalam has spent over 15 years in the biotech industry. Before joining the industry, Dr. Alampalam worked on pathosynthology of myelodysplastic syndrome and has authored and co-authored multiple publication abstracts and book chapters. He received his PhD from the University of Toledo Medical Center in 1996 and did postdoctoral research at the Cleveland Clinic and Rush University Medical Center before moving to the biotech. He has been at Kyogen since 2008. I will now turn it over to the doctor from his presentation. Thank you very much for the very kind uh, introduction, Robert, and uh, welcome you all uh, to this uh, live webinar on microbial pathogenesis and host immune responses. Before I go to the next slide, I just want to go through this legal disclaimer. Kyogen products shown here are intended for molecular biology applications. These products are not intended for diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of a disease. For up-to-date information and licensing information, please visit our kyogen.com or look in your uh, kit handbook or user manual. You should also talk to your local technical support or your local distributor. Okay, now with that being done, let's move on to the agenda today. Today I'll be covering four topics. First is introduction to microbiome. Second, host pathogen interactions. Third, host defense mechanisms. And the last is the technology. Now, why do I have this uh, agenda here? 
I know there are a lot of people, researchers, are now getting into the field of microbiome. Into starting a lot of people I see from the field of cancer, metabolic disorders, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, neuroscientists, behavioral scientists, and many of them are coming, getting into this field. But one of the key questions that they are facing is sometimes regarding the definitions of what we, uh, what, what does each mean? So I'm going to spend a couple of slides on the, on the introduction part of it. Of course, the second and the third are pretty much, uh, self-explanatory, which are dealing with the biology of, uh, of the interaction between microbes and humans, we being the host. And, and the last is the, uh, the part will actually deal with how can you explore these interactions between the host and the microbes. So the first topic is introduction to microbiome. So what does microbiome mean? Microbiome is defined as the collective genomes of microbes. This can be composed of bacteria, bacteriophage, fungi, protozoa, viruses that live inside and on the human body. So the microbiome is a complete collective that, of microbiomes that is living inside and on the human body. This is based on the, one of the definitions given in NIH uh, report, uh, publication in 2012. Then the second term, which often leads to confusion, is microbiota. What does this involve? Microbiota refers to the collection of microorganisms that inhabits in a specific environment. For example, it can be soil, microbiome, microbes in water, or it can be within an organism or on including gut my, microbiota, or if you can look at urinary microbiota. And these uh, microorganisms can be either commensal or pathogenic. The last definition, which often uh, is a challenge, um, uh, is, 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 is that the last thing is the definition of metagenomics. It is a study of collective genomes of microorganisms from a sample without cultivation. A very uh, simple uh, example, again, is, is, that, is that why is it without cultivation or even uh, sometimes which it doesn't uh, need to be uh, cultivated in the lab. Many of the microorganisms that come, out, uh, come for study from the environmental samples you don't have enough to culture them or you cannot culture them. So these, these microbes automatically fall under this category of microorganisms from sample without cultivation. As, as I said here, all these definitions are based on the specific uh, nature review genetics that was published in 2012. Now, the interest in microbiome has been a hot topic uh, since uh, the time that NIH started the Human Microbiome Project several years ago. Now, the goal of this uh, project was to enable a comprehensive characterization of the human microbiome and analysis of its role in human health and disease. And for this, this is what they, for this study, what they did is that they screened about 242 healthy individuals to see if they can discern the baseline of healthy human microbiome and in different body sites. What they found in the study is that there are about 10,000 or more unique living organisms, which is in or outside of us. Of course, you don't quote me on this number. This is there in the study, but it can be more or it can be less, plus or minus. And these 10,000 plus organisms, they have about 8 million genes. That's why this is also called as the second genome in the human system. And the study also, uh, I think uh, in addition to identifying the microbiomes in, in the uh, microbiota of healthy people, it showed that there are different uh, organisms or different groups of organisms or communities of organisms present in different sites of the body. And there are different factors um, that affect um, this microbial uh, com composition of these microbial communities like race, gender, BMI, ethnicity. Now, in this uh, specific uh, graph on the left-hand side, 
what, what, what we are trying to show you is the base map of healthy individuals. As you see that, we have trillions of microorganisms, and this is the principal component graph, which shows you the different kinds of microorganisms present in, in, in the human system. For example, the red color, what you see, is from the microorganisms based on the on airways. You have the orange color, which is from the GI tract, the blue color from the oral, and the rest a composite mix of all the skin and urogenital tract. So basically what this graph is telling you is the different in the microbial communities, the composition of the microbial communities from each part of the body is pretty different. And that is very, uh, if you think of it, it's very, uh, it has to be different because the exposure of the, uh, uh, of the nose, of the interior epithelial layer of the nose is different from the composition of the, of a gut, which is more acidic, whereas maybe our nose is different. At the same time, it also, if a person is a little bit uh, sick, uh, then naturally the, the composition of the nose, um, uh, the bacteria will be different, and it, all, it will also be different from that of the mouth. So basically on the left-hand side, this graph tells you the, that how it, the composition of the microbiome um, is different in each part of the body. The, gra the uh, graph on the right-hand side um, is again, uh, tell, shows you the microbiota of the gut, which is profoundly altered during pregnancy. Now, this is based on a publication uh, that was done in Cell several years ago. The authors, what they did, they characterized the changes in the gut microbiota that occur from the first uh, trimester to the third trimester of pregnancy. And what they reported is interesting. They said that the microbial diversity is changing during, diversity, uh, in, during pregnancy, and I think they are showing it very nicely here. Second is, and they also show in that the change is not related to the health state, it is more related to pregnancy, it's pregnancy specific. And the newborn, newborn babies are also, uh, important thing is the newborn babies have a distinct micro, uh, gut microbiome. And that again, a very interesting um, feature. So if, so if we if, if we are to see the changes in microbial uh, community from one side to another, it may indicate that something is wrong. These changes may also affect the human biosystem. Now the microbiome interacts with the host to play uh, and plays an important role in multiple diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, muscular dystrophy, cancer, fibromyalgia, and that is one of the reasons why we see a lot of different, uh, different science, uh, scientists who are working in, in the researchers, working in different areas, uh, trying to see what is the influence of microbiome you know, on the disease they are working on. We know that the, some of the microbes can modify the production of neurotransmitters, and they also affect other uh, uh, neuro diseases, such as schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, etc. Again, these are all uh, a result of the, uh, the, uh, the initiative uh, of the, uh, based on the microbiome uh, project, micro human microbiome project. So this is, uh, so what we did in this section is that we started off with uh, saying, okay, what we give you a definition of the microbiome, and then we go through some terminologies, and then we just give a quick, uh, high, very high level overview of uh, the, where are we with microbiome today? The next section is, uh, is most to deal with the host pathogen interaction. Now, host pathogen interaction, this is, and we have to understand uh, this dual role of microbiota in the human, human health and disease. The interaction of the host and the microbiota, it's kind of a dual necessity. The, Hosts and microorganisms have co-involved and peacefully coexisted to achieve a mutually beneficial relationship, which we call define it as a symbiotic relationship. The, uh, in this uh, relationship, the job, the job of the host is to provide the microbiota a niche with a stable nutrient supply. And the microbiome, the microbiota in turn uh, performs some very essential functions uh, for human physiology, including metabolic, digestive, and immune uh, mechanisms. The gut mi uh, microbiota, as you can see, it regulates uh, the, uh, the host metabolic function and energy balance. It provides the host with the capacity uh, to uh, 
to hydrolyze complex plant sugars and it's also synthesized as vitamins and detoxify the xenobiotics in mutualistic content. Some research has also found that microbiota affect the most fundamental of the host physiology of phenotypes, including aging. Actually, there is a very nice article in Cell uh, that is titled, uh, I think it was published, You Are What You Host, uh, Microbiome Modulation of Aging Process. I think we are all familiar with what you are, what you eat, but I think but this, uh, uh, this interesting uh, uh, the article that was published in, I think, 2014, which says, uh, we talk about you are what you host. And we know that the gut mi um, microbiota can protect the host from many infections. And the actual protection mechanisms are not clearly understood, but we kind of have some ideas on that. And also the relationship between the host and uh, the, this uh, is very complex, but it is a very efficient way for the host and the microbiota, microbiota to um, coexist. This, this symbiosis, uh, pro it, it also provides a stable and a common metabolic pattern and well-balanced physiological homeostasis. Now in this uh, graph, basically it shows you the direct uh, and indirect protection of my, uh, mechanisms of how the, the, the interactions between the host and the microbiota. It, of course, is a very complex uh, picture, and I, I think it's one of the very uh, pictures I really picked it up because it, it very clearly explains the whole comp the, the entire complexity of the interaction of the host and the microbiome. And uh, again, this is uh, out of uh, the uh, Nature uh, Reviews in Immunology, again, that was published in 2013. So first, let's look at an interesting uh, area where the, what are the interactions as direct interactions. Now, common cell bacteria, as you know, it directly uh, uh, competes with the, with the pathogens. So the, so first is the, the, because the common cell bacteria number is high uh, and the pathogens are low, um, the common cell bacteria uses the nutrients up and it, it prevents um, uh, the, the non it doesn't allow or doesn't uh, provide the pathogens, the nutrients that need to uh, grow and localize. So that is one of the ways common cell pathogens are one of the strategies uh, that the common cell pathogens are uh, uh, preventing the, human, uh, the infection by pathogens. In addition, this common cell, uh, some of the bacterial strains can metabolize the protein to certain sugars that inhibit the uh, production of uh, virulence factors for the pathogen. On the other hand, pathogens have also evolved strategies to overcome this competition by uh, common cell bacteria. This, uh, one thing is that this common cell bacteria, they produce a certain virulence factors directly kills some of the uh, common cell pathogens, one. Number two, number two is that the pathogens also induce inflammation of the epithelial cells, and the inflamed cells in turn produces nutrients that are that can be specifically used only by the pathogens, and thus um, uh, just promote the growth of pathogens. Also, the pathogens can localize uh, in the, uh, to the epithelial uh, associated niches that are devoid of common cell uh, bacteria, and thus use use the nutrients here. Thus, they can overcome or they can uh, override this um, competition for uh, nutrients uh, with the direct resident organisms. Now, common cell bacteria also uses uh, some of the indirect mechanisms um, to, uh, to compete with the pathogens. First, this common cell bacteria can enhance, one of the things they do is they enhance the epithelial barrier function by producing metabolites. For example, the some bacteria catabolize or metabolize the polysaccharides to produce uh, short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain fatty acids can enhance the epithelial cell barrier function. In addition, the common cell microbiota can promote mucus production and release of antimicrobial peptides to epithelial cells to prevent pathogen colonization and proliferation. The microbiota can activate some innate immune cells and macrophages, neutrophils, interleukins, as well as the T helper cells, T17 cells to limit uh, pathogen colonization. 
but, but there are a lot of uh, questions, especially there are in, during the last several years. A lot of researchers have tried to dissect the role of this um, microbiota with some interesting questions, saying, okay, how uh, uh, this microbiota interacts with us? Wh which microorganisms are interacting? Uh, or who, uh, the, or when are these, how, how do they interact with the immune systems? It's just uh, basically a lot of research is being done to find out which bacteria is, is involved and which, how, in what uh, uh, order how that happens, which bacteria comes first, uh, establishes the, um, the colony, and then how, they, uh, and, and how, how it penetrates the immune system. What are the signaling pathways they're trying to involve, involved in this? Now, what viral factors, pathogens, sex to come and uh, to, uh, to uh, kill the uh, microbiota? And how the uh, inflammation, uh, how they induce inflammation to induce survival. And of course, the most important, I think, the, the most interesting thing I see is the antibiotic resistance genes that are involved in this whole process. A lot of studies have been carried out to understand this whole, um, how the microbiota enhances the innate immunity in pathogens, what players in the immune systems are involved, what inflammatory molecules are produced, which cytokines are, are, are produced here. As I see, there are a lot of, lot, of, lot of questions, and this whole microbiota host interaction is a very interesting topic, and it's a, a just a, um, it's almost a no man's land where we don't know what's going on there. Um, and there's a lot of talk, um, uh, uh, cross talk we know between the microbiome and the immune system that's within the host. The microbiota can shape the immune system both directly and indirectly. The microbiota not only shapes the cellular components of the immune system, but also regulates some proteins and genes. This shaping in, uh, includes gut my, uh, the gut microbiota uh, can impact the lymphoid structure development and epithelial function. The key question is, can it enhance the uh, innate immune response by, by specific pathogen? We also know that this microbiota can shape the T cell subjects, subsets, and can actually affect which T cells are going to be produced and how much these T cells are going to be expressed. Microbiota also provides roles, um, protective roles against like systemic infection. The microbiota can prime the immune, uh, immune system to be ready. Of course, the, uh, all this being said, there's a lot of mechanisms of, uh, uh, it's not very still clear. Some, some studies indicate that commercial bacteria might even promote uh, host defense at distant sites through the release of certain uh, molecules. So the commercial bacteria has, uh, has multiple roles, um, and it, it, the main, main, main function is, one of the main functions is to prevent uh, the invasion by pathogens. Uh, <clears throat> Similarly, the immune system exerts important control over the microbiota. Even microbiota participate in, in many functions that are essential to the host. host like we just, I, just, I just mentioned, the digestion, regulation of energy metabolism, modulation of inflammation, and immunity. When they are outgrown or become abnormal, they, they, they may cause a lot of problems. When one bacterium transmits um, virulence factors to another bacterium, that bacteria may become pathogenic and may induce the inflammation of epithelial cells. This may further affect the immune system. So it is very important for the host immune system to maintain the homeostasis with the residential um, micro, microbial communities, that ensuring that the mutualistic nature of host microbial relation or host uh, pathogen uh, or host uh, commensal microorganism relation is actually maintained. The immune system uh, needs, to, uh, needs to also exert critical controls over stratification and compartment, compartmentalization of the microbiota. It also exerts control over the microbiota composition, and this also controls the diversity and the location of the micro, uh, microbiota. This can be done through sensors um, of the innate immune system or a number of innate uh, effector molecules that it may also be done through T and B cells. Uh, of course, when you look at this slide, it looks like um, the, the, the presence of numerous sensors and numerous cells, and it almost reminds me of the driverless cars, which the whole system is so, mecha uh, to, so 
autonomous and it just it, it goes on at the, at the autonomous working function we have unless we don't um, try to disturb the system the whole system moves on very smoothly So this slide basically shows you the, the, some of the diseases that microbiota, uh, my, microbiota are involved. For example, um, example in the gut, you have the intestinal, uh, the gut uh, plays, a, plays a positive role, but when that disturbed, when the, when the, as I said, when the relationship is disturbed, um, uh, then the host and the microbiota get the host. The relationship between the host and the microbiota is disrupted, and that can contribute towards all the diseases. For example, in the uh, for example in the gut, it can lead to uh, intestinal infections. Um, it can lead to obesity, um, infl uh, inflammatory bowel, uh, bowel disease. I think you, many of you are familiar with what we call fecal transplants that is happening. And interestingly, very recently there was a paper about viruses playing an important role um, in, uh, in the absence or a presence of a specific virus actually increases the impact of a, uh, of a microbial uh, uh, microbe in that in, in that arena. And then I was also that made me think. In addition to fecal transplant, where it is more to do with bacteria, maybe also uh, it do we will. Will there be a time when we do actually viral infection, viral uh, transplant or viruses and, uh, and an important, or uh, important that viruses in that, in restoring the, uh, the common cell uh, microbiota? I don't know. This is again, uh, something that is my, of my interest where I always often think in addition to bacteria, how much of these, um, uh, diseases, including the viruses can play an important role here. And there's a lot of research has been, that has been trying to uh, find a link between gut microbiome and many of these diseases. I know I just list a couple of diseases here, but there are a lot of, uh, as I say, uh, diseases happening, including the airway where you have pneumonia and respiratory infections. You have uh, COPD uh, that's happening or cystic fibrosis uh, as, that is there in, in airways in, in the urogenital system. We have vaginosis, UTI or STDs uh, happening in blood. We have sepsis and bloodstream infections. And of course, in, in the oral, uh, we have something this is like uh, uh, gingivitis. So in all these, uh, thing, uh, in all these, uh, what is one one thing that we don't know is uh, about a specific biomarkers. Are there any specific biomarkers that will uh, t uh, give us a hint early enough uh, about the disease of, uh, of about changes in the microbial uh, uh, um, in the common cell, uh, microbiomes? Are there any biomarkers in the blood? And I think that would be interesting to know because um, there are very small changes in this uh, uh, in, in, in these biomarkers and will help tell us oh there's some something happening in the gut and uh, so we can maybe. Uh, before the whole, uh, 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 like for example, sepsis. If we, by the time we detect sepsis, it's really too late. We, the, the sepsis is already taken; uh, it's, uh, it's hold on the system, and we then the person undergoes a very uh, traumatic uh, 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 antibiotic and other series of treatment strategies. But can we identify this early enough? Can we identify maybe an uh, indication of sepsis earlier, or um, can we do that? Uh, are there any biomarkers for that? That would be an interesting area of research, which uh, uh, always that uh, uh, makes me think about this biomarkers and how, how in, especially in this field. Um, so the next is, uh, is to say that when, when the composition of the microbiota is changed or microbiota becomes abnormal, the changes, the challenges we face as a host is to understand um, that to understand the common cell bacteria do not always protect against pathogen infection or and in co certain contexts that they, they can facilitate it and under certain conditions particularly bacterial populations can acquire pathogenic properties so the, so the question is um, how does the host discriminate between symbiotic and pathogenic bacteria to adjust this level of immune response so that brings us to the next topic of the host defense mechanisms the host different mechanisms, again, this slide is Immunology 101, what I call it, where you have, we're talking about innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system basically recognizes the pathogens and it is the first line of defense against pathogens. It recognizes the incoming pathogens via the complement system and the pattern recognition receptors. 
the characteristic uh, of the immune system, uh, of the innate immune system, is that it is not specific and does not count for long-lasting uh, uh, immunity. The, the, ma the major players are the immune cells, the uh, dendritic cells, and the macrophages, intestinal epithelial cells, and myofibroblasts. The pattern recognition receptors, like the TLR, recognize um, the pathogens, activate the innate immune response, initiate downstream signaling, and induces expression of inflammatory cytokines and the type 1 interferon response. This interferon response activates adaptive immunity. L, adaptive immunity is a highly specific, long-lasting, and adaptable. And, of course, the major players are the T and the B cells. And these cells allow the immune uh, adaptive system to mount stronger response upon uh, next uh, exposure to pathogen. The crosstalk between the innate and, uh, uh, and uh, adaptive immunity is, is very critical and because this activates a lot of different um, uh, complex series of pathways. The TLRs, um, as in, are also called toll-like receptors, they link the innate and adaptive immunity. TLRs are basically pattern, pattern recognition uh, receptors, or what I call PRR, and they can detect a wide range of bacteria, virus, fungus, and they play a very crucial role in linking innate and adaptive immune responses to the actions of T cells and uh, dendritic cells. Now, toll-like receptors include like about 10, uh, 10 human pathogens, uh, sorry, 10 different human receptors, and also adaptive proteins. The TLRs regulate many signaling pathways, as shown here, and, and upon uh, TLR activation, many events can be induced. The in activation of a TLR induces expression of many required uh, cytokines, chemokines, antim antimicrobial molecules, and MHCs, and, and co-stimulation of mole co-stimulatory molecules uh, that are important for adaptive immune response. As you see, you know, this is a very uh, complex network, and a lot of, lot of research needs to be done to understand this uh, interaction. To understand the adaptive immune response, um, which involves the T and the B cells, um, this is very specific, and whatever response we get are pathogen-specific. And here, cytokines play a very important role. The T cell-mediated adaptive immunity development is highly dependent on the innate immunity-associated uh, antigen-presenting cells. These cells produce a distinct pattern of cytokines, and these cytokines contribute to the subsequent polarization and activation of specific T cells. And upon pathogen activation, based on pattern recognition of cytokine production, the T cells are divided into two subsets, the T helper 1 and the T helper 2. And these uh, subsets of cells have specific immune functions. Uh, for example, the TH1 produces the cell-mediated CMI or uh, cell-mediated immunity, secrete cytokines such as interferon gamma or TNF alpha, whereas TH2 cells promote the humoral immunity, produce immunogenic factors like interleukin 13. So basically, this slide uh, is a fantastic slide where it basically summarizes the whole host of defense mechanisms in the innate and the immune uh, responses and some key factors and other regulators that are involved. The, the, innate, and the, the uh, innate and adaptive immune cells live uh, along with um, thousands of uh, commensal or, uh, organisms, and uh, the intestinal epithelial cells form a barrier to maintain the segregation between microbial communities and mucosal uh, uh, immune system. These, intelligent, uh, these intestinal epithelial cells are crucial mediators of intestinal uh, homeostasis. And the PRRs are the, what you call as a uh, pattern recognition uh, receptors, recognize conserved uh, like microbial associated molecular motifs and mo the pathogen specific virulent properties and produce specific cytokines. And the cytokines involved, I, as you see here, as you see all over here, are the uh, are the, inter, uh, the interleukins like uh, the uh, interleukin 25, which is derived from in, in the epithelial cells. Then it also includes the IL-25, IL-33, uh, the uh, IL-C2s. On the other hand, interleukin 25 limits the macrophage uh, to produce inflammatory cytokines such as IL uh, interleukin IL-1, IL-1 beta, or interleukin 23, IL-22, and there are multiple. Uh, uh, Cytokines that are, that are expressed to suppress sometimes the innate lymphoid cell subsets also. A lot of research has been focused to understand the interaction between microbiota and host microbiome response, identifying the key regulators involved in the host different mechanisms. 
this is a very open, again, uh, as I said, the host pathogen interaction has been a question of study for a very long time, whereas the host different mechanisms, including that, are also a lot of uh, uh, questions are being uh, done in that area. Now, let's look at the, the, the we have seen all this. We have seen the, uh, what is happening in the microbiome. We have seen the interaction between host pathogen and detection, uh, host pathogen interaction, pathogen interaction, and also we have seen the host uh, defense mechanisms. So one of the key things here is how are we going to first, is how are you going to detect this bacterium? The, the species identification, which bacteria is where? And are there uh, major and minor uh, clones? For example, uh, in, in, as, in some, uh, anybody from the field of cancer know what you call as, as a tumor heterogeneity or cellular heterogeneity. What is the level of heterogeneity you see in these, uh, in, in these uh, uh, different parts of the body? And does that composition, uh, how does that composition uh, uh, affect the overall performance of that system or that specific organ? And can, uh, are there any biomarkers that are released um, out um, of this uh, quick, uh, 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 when there are small changes? And uh, what happens if, if you, uh, to, um, if, if, for example, a person suffering from TB who's uh, uh, tuberculosis infection, uh, he's uh, over, they undergo treatment for nine months or 13 months or whatever they're, uh, depending on the level of infection. What happens to the open system, to the human uh, microbiota? What happens to the microbiota when you treat a person with, uh, with, uh, who's undergoing cancer treatment? And can we, uh, how can we identify this bacteria? So we need technologies um, to actually identify these. There are different ways. Of course, um, uh, next generation sequencing is one of the ways in which we can detect uh, this. Or we can also detect using PCR-based methods using the technology. And now we are coming to the next topic as the technologies for exploring this host pathogen interaction. So when you're looking at this uh, uh, host pathogen interaction, when you're trying to study that, what, are, what can you look for? Either you can look at the genomics part of it or you can look at the transcriptomics where you characterize the RNA, metabolics, uh, metabolomics, where you can uh, look at the metabolites of the small molecules that are released, and also the proteomics, where you can, uh, you can look at the proteins and the peptides. So, of course, there are many different questions that, that can be asked. So are, one of the first questions I just stated here is that, are there changes in the composition of the microbiome? And how are they associated with the disease? How do microbial functions change in a disease at the RNA, DNA, protein, and metabolite level? Now, how do metabolic changes change in a disease, uh, uh, metabolic processes change in a disease, and how does, the, how does an intervention or treatment like uh, affect the composition um, and function of the microbial community? I think a, a couple of slides ago I discussed, uh, we talked about the fecal displant or viral uh, fecal implant of uh, changing, uh, changing the composition. Um, I know in many of the alternative medicines, one of the focus is to bring back the balance. Um, if, you, if you look at the, some of the alternative medicine strategies, is to bring back the balance of the, of the system. And they use different things. Uh, sometimes uh, they use herbs. Or sometimes they use the naturally occurring uh, chemicals or um, some of the compounds that are, uh, that are, uh, which are derived from, uh, from herbs. And if that is the case, <coughs> Uh, so uh, we need a uh, ways to uh, detect that it is the impact of those uh, uh, those uh, alternative medicines that we take or in, in anything we take in fact uh, to bring back the balance and that is what is here is can we continuously monitor these uh, changes in the composition of the bacteria so to do to that to happen we need very highly sensitive technologies so if, if you're trying to get into that kind of field of study, so you can, you can take a human microbiome sample. You can either extract DNA, the RNA, or the proteins. And you can, when you extract the DNA, you can either look at the 16S rRNA gene sequencing, or you can look at 80S rRNA sequencing, or you can look at the total DNA sequence shotgun approach. Then, of course, you can look at the bacteria and, and archaea, or you can look at the fungus and this. And basically, you're asking the question is, what organisms are present and what is the relative abundance? 
that is the kind of question you're looking at first the first thing you're looking at and then you're looking at what are the functions of all these uh, communities uh, what is the, what is the function and how how, how do they uh, what what are the what is the impact of them on the on the local on the local micro environment um, <clears throat> so there are several areas uh, the but of course, when you're looking at these uh, microbial uh, study of these microbial communities, there are several challenges that come. And um, one of them, of course, everything starts with a sample. And it's almost like a garbage in, garbage out, where you have don't prepare your sample correctly. Then certainly the data you're going to get at the end of the experiment will be not uh, not very uh, not non-conclusive, or they can be lead to false positives or false negatives. And here I just listed some of the uh, uh, requirements that you need to keep in mind when you're trying to work with the samples that come from microbiome. First is insufficient homo homogenization of the sample matrix. So if you're taking a tissue, if you're, looking, uh, if you're taking a gut, and you're saying, I want to look at all the microbials in the, in the gut, um, and then you have to make sure that you, it is properly homogenized uh, and the sam sample and so that it's all uh, coming. First, you are taking all the microbes out, and then instead of them lumping, uh, as uh, some, sometimes it, it happens, we want to make sure that they are clearly uh, separated and uh, they make it dislodged. So now you have the or, uh, uh, organisms in a tube. If you want to study the RNA, DNA, or the protein, you want to make sure that the cells are sufficiently um, liked. And this is something a challenge is that you want to uh, is of lighting the cells in, in a very efficient way without actually causing any extensive degradation of your nucleic of, of your uh, DNA. And this can happen mainly when you your you don't have uh, uh, enough nucleases uh, inactivation of you know, the nucleases. You don't have any inhibitors that are uh, needed to uh, inactivate all the nucleases and the proteases that are present in the solutions. Sometimes, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, we uh, tend to uh, actually uh, destruct some of the template itself. Another important thing is insufficient solubilization of analytes of interest or separation from intercellular components. I mean, this is a very interesting area because sometimes you have components which are not soluble and we are unable to detect it using uh, Maldorf or something. Uh, this is mainly the, when you look at the metabolites. And they precipitate out, and we just uh, sometimes we remove the precipitate, uh, thinking this is uh, just a precipitate, uh, or something that floats out. That's why insufficient solubilization of analyte is something that you have to be careful about. The next is the unintended precipitation of nucleic acids, um, as I mentioned. Um, again, the same thing. Uh, these are all I mean, these are all the complexities that arise because of the sample, the nature of the sample. And also the difference in the nature. For example, if you're looking at uh, a different, uh, like if you're looking at gut or if you're looking at the mouth or if you're looking at the nasal areas, the, the environment is different. The, the microbes, uh, are uh, the interaction is different. And we want to make sure you get all the uh, uh, microbes in each of this area to understand the, 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 the heterogeneity in the microbial population there. And uh, when you do the purification of the sample, sometimes you, this un unintended precipitation of nucleic acids um, can also happen because of some of the metals or bi bi to amines that can happen. And we might lose some of the DNA and some of the, or maybe some of the complexities of the uh, organisms. And second is low yielding. Uh, we might lose, uh, we need to look, watch out for this low yield binding uh, interaction with purification matrices. Sometimes we use a different kinds of there are a lot of different kits available in the market, and all of these kits have different uh, strategies for purification. Sometimes there are, uh, the, when the strategy is to bind it to a specific uh, uh, purification matrix, and we, it doesn't yield. It doesn't, once you bind it, remove or wash off the impurities, and then you uh, try to elute it out of that binding interaction, then it, does, it doesn't uh, come out completely and leads to low yield. So this is something you have to watch out. And the last, I think, uh, is that co-purification of small molecular inhibitors of the PCR process. Now, this is with, with our, our 
attempt to get all the nucleic acids uh, and our attempt to get um, uh, lice all the cells with our, uh, with our attempt to uh, make sure that it's not degraded. The, with all this, we add a lot of different uh, chemicals into our system. And what happens, these, these chemicals um, or inhibitors, they also become inhibitors, downstream uh, inhibitors. For example, if you're trying to do a PCR and we have inhibitors, then probably even though you're you have been very successful in isolating the nucleic acids, RNA or DNA. You know, there are inhibitors that actually can cause problems for you. Now, this is something, these are some of the uh, points you need to keep in mind when you are uh, trying to uh, do a, a microbiome study. And, and in this uh, specific uh, slide, which I'm trying to uh, show you, uh, are, are the different, as I said, the inhibitors and the lysis. Of course, recently, um, uh, well, as you know, the chitin is very strong in the in our uh, in in sample prep. But one of the areas where chitin did not very very dominant or very good at is that in the sample prep in microbiome study. So recently, uh, we acquired this company called MoBio. I think I think everybody is very familiar with that. Uh, that Mobio uh, was acquired by Kaizen, and this is they are as I say, specializing in mostly in soil RNA DNA isolation, which is one of the most difficult uh, areas, especially if you are trying to get into this uh, uh, DNA RNA isolation. And it's uh, the uh, one of the one of the key things that Mobio specializes is, in fact, is the. Is isolation of um, uh, sample prep, especially with high, high, high inhibitors, that is leaf tissue or your stool and gut, soil microbes, also, also from my biofilms. As you see, if you, if you look at that um, inhibitors, um, in this graph is easy to difficult, and if you look on the y-axis, it's low to high. The FFP, blood, uh, some of this, or, or even if you look at pure microbial cultures, they're easy to, uh, they're a little easier, but one of the most difficult uh, samples are, uh, for example, leafy tissue is mostly for when it's very fibrous, whereas stools, micro, the biofilms, these are all more because of the uh, inhibitors, high level of inhibitors. And, uh, Okay. Uh, okay. So basically, uh, one of the things that uh, that mobile specializes is that inhibitor removal technology, or basically the, uh, the IRT. So after you uh, lyse the cells, the homogenize the gene community uh, after lysis, the, to increase the purity, we also have the inhibitor removal technologies uh, set up, uh, which is basically a proprietary technology which actually removes this and makes your sample more uh, amenable to down, a lot of downstream uh, applications. And this is also uh, this is also customizable throughput where, uh, where, where either you can go for single silica filters, uh, spin filters to unique non-fouling clear mag beads in a high throughput automated applications. Now, uh, now that we have, um, uh, uh, we have, we have used a certain technology to isolate the microbe, uh, isolate your um, uh, DNA or RNA, uh, whatever you are going to for, and then the thing is how can we identify these or how can we um, monitor these? And there are different technologies, right? Either you can culture something or you can clone something, you can do micro, uh, micro arrays, you can do MOLDES, you can do NGS or you can do qPCR. It can be any of these one technologies that can be used to identify the microbes. But, but what, is the key, what are the key limitations of these? The key limitations are that they are time consuming. Um, they can, uh, some of them involve a lot of steps, uh, which involve five to seven days, I think, you know, the culture-based methods. Then uh, sometimes you cannot identify all the pathogens, especially if you're trying to grow a microbe on a blood agar plate or uh, some, uh, some, uh, some plates, and if it doesn't grow properly, or there are other selective medias that are there. In that case, these are, many of them are non-culturable, especially if you're looking, starting from, um, especially in the, in the environmental samples, many a times this happens that we, uh, they're not culturable, then we cannot identify the pathogen. This is kind of a, um, a challenge we have. Um, and, and and also this whole uh, uh, culture-based detection this is pretty extensive and with a lot of uh, training required. That's also one of the limitations of that. And also the protocols, as example, you need, sometimes you need a false soil, you need a soil agar plate, whereas for, if you need a, especially if you are something pathogenic, 
pathogenic, then you need a blood agar plate. Uh, all the different protocols that are required for identification of this cell. And, uh, and in addition to that, there's a lot of, uh, it also generates a lot of waste. So the culture-based method uh, that has been there for a long time and uh, and it has, it has served the humans uh, us a lot in this understanding study, it has certainly has a lot of disadvantages. And with the advent of molecular biology, we can we can come up with, a very, as I said, real-time PCR is a very good and easy way of detecting in addition to next-generation sequencing. And why do people prefer uh, uh, this uh, uh, PCR-based technology? It simply is because it's rapid, sensitive, standardized, and specific. I think it's, it's very, we all know that part. And uh, rapid detection, again, I think we all know the, how we did that similar rapid detection for AIDS viruses. We did rapid detection for bacterial viruses, for, of course, including uh, a lot of the studies were done, um, bacterials and the viruses and detection in, in the salmonella outbreak, you know, how, how it was used, not only in the lab, but it was also done at the field level. Many of times we are able to do that. This is a rapid, they have a very uh, low copy number, be highly sensitive. Um, and then we have the uh, standardized automatic protocols that have been done, and also they are very specific because they detect very specific target sequences. In addition to that, by detection of microbial qPCR, there are other technologies for exploring host pathogens. Um, and as, as I mentioned here, you can detect the, uh, all the uh, RNAs. You can isolate. You can there are different kits that are available to uh, isolate the RNA. Uh, uh, for example, the RNA DNA kind RNA DNA microbiome kit, or fast DNA tool kit, um, pathogen kit. Now, one question that often uh, comes: We have so many different kits. Why do you have that? As I mentioned before, the micro, the environment uh, in, in a, uh, uh, we have in a stool is very different from an environment in the blood, and it's very different uh, from uh, environment from a nasal swab. So this, the, the uh, microbes as well as uh, the the conditions are very different. That's why we need very specialized uh, 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 tools uh, to uh, isolate this. Because if you come from the gut, maybe it's very uh, in certain areas of the body, very acidic, whereas some areas are very alkaline. So we need buffers to uh, make it neutralize it and make sure they are, uh, can be so that they, it can be isolated properly. And that's why we have all these different kits. So this is important that you follow. You use a specific kit for isolating that uh, treat that specific sample. And also, we have the microbial DNA qPCR arrays. It's one, one. So once you've isolated it, the, we, uh, uh, we, have, we can detect it using qPCR. And in addition to qPCR, remember that we talked about the cytokines and the uh, different uh, chemokines that are released when the, when the, uh, when the systems are uh, this. Um, when the, so we can detect the release of the cytokines, not only at the protein level, but it's much more sensitive when you detect it at the RNA level. So that's why we already have systems for that. This is just a quick workflow of that the Kaizen offers. Where you, or for any system, you can use this. But basically, the workflow starts with sample collection. You have DNA purification, DNA amplification, library prep. This is we are looking MGS as a way of doing it, and then you also have verification by qPCR. And the, the DNA purification, uh, we have the whole set of uh, kits that I talked about. Then let's say you're starting with very small amount of, like, especially in the en environmental samples, you have five my, my microbes or 10 microbes, you might need to amplify the DNA before you go further, amplify the uh, RNA before you go, uh, especially the DNA if you go into further. So you have the replicate single cell, single cell technology. So I just want to bring your attention towards the fact that the single cell technologies, which are, are designed to uh, enable you to work from very small amount of uh, nucleic acids, maybe uh, either RNA or DNA. Um, and the key thing there is that if, for example, there are only 100 genes that are expressed in the bacteria at a specific uh, time, um, then you want uniform amplification uh, of all the 100 genes when you go to the next step, go from DNA amplification to library preparation. This is mainly for if you're doing um, uh, next generation sequencing strategies. So a uniform amplification is very critical. And one of the technologies that is very well known and very well established is the um, multiple displacement or MDA amplification um, you know, technology and refugees based on that. So this is something that you might want to think about when you're trying to use very small amount of DNA sample, especially in, in, meta, in the metagenomics, it might be very helpful. So once you prepare your libraries, then you can uh, uh, basically verify by qPCR. So what we, let's talk about this more like the qPCR verification part once you're done with the 
what tools are available. So uh, from uh, from the Kaizen base, you know, we have lot of different uh, 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 arrays, um, as I said, and a lot of different antibiotic genes, bacterial vaginosis, a lot of different genes that are available in our at our end to um, arrays that are available. Um, there are close to 600 different bacterial identification hashes that are available, eight for fungi, one for protein, 87 antibiotic resistant genes. This is a, a very popular item in our end where uh, a lot of people are looking at antibiotic genes and they're trying to find out using this as a, how quickly the antibiotic genes are coming and evolution of these genes in, in a specific sample. And how is this designed, uh, as you see, these are basically, the process is very simple if you're trying to do that. Isolate your DNA. Um, and then after that, do you assays and arrays, and you do data analysis. And it is basically the is content, custom, and uh, and control. These are three Cs. Where you see, we have the largest microbiome portfolio. Um, as I said, we have 580 verified assays. What does this mean? Is that we have to designed the system and actually verified it in our lab, and we know that works. So this are, that's why it's called experimentally verified assays. There are different kinds when you do, especially this huge number of number of cells, you know, bio, bioinformatically designed and then experimentally verified. Bioinformatically designed is they're using uh, algorithm designed the, uh, the primers for detection of these uh, microbes, but experimentally designed is when you actually verify it in the lab and we know that it works. The custom is when you have uh, uh, A to uh, 384 different uh, custom designs we can do uh, if you want to design a plate like this, then you can add whatever genes you want to add. That is custom designing. And controls, this is the most important thing, where you have integrated controls to uh, uh, make sure that your all your uh, controls are there. For example, your host controls, then you have PAN EC controls, PAN D1 controls, or the, uh, or the PPC controls, positive PCR controls. And these can data as well as 10 uh, copies, um, and the data is available for that. This slide basically shows, so the First, we talked about the detection of the microbes. Now here, this, this slide basically deals with the detection of the cytokines at the uh, transcript level. How can you do uh, cytokines? And you start, same thing, you start with the sample, sample preparation, DNA, uh, DNA RNA purification, gene expression analysis, and data analysis. And this whole RT squared PCR array is designed as related to, to using PCR-based approach to detect this side, uh, to uh, verify uh, after their NGS step. Or even you can, if you don't have, want to use the NGS approach, you can even go directly and do the PCR, uh, PCR-based approach. And you can answer many multiple questions, either regarding inflammation. So we have, a, if, let's say the question that we'll answer here is that um, which genes are activated uh, early in an infection, inflammation, which microbes uh, or which genes are activated in the chronic infection, and what happens in, uh, after the disease is dissolved? What are the changes that are happening in the, in the overall gene expression pattern? And as I said, we have a whole about... Again, about 80, 370 D genes can be simultaneously, uh, if you want to do, in, a, in all these different response. For example, if you're trying to look at antifungal response, you can do look at 370 genes if you, if you want, or you can design your own arrays. The data analysis, so, so once you've det detected these uh, microbes, right, you can also, sorry, if you can detect these transcripts, once you're done with the array, how do you analyze the data? So we also offer you a very complete and easy to uh, web-based Excel software. So you take the data, um, upload it, and you can get these plots within data to analysis up to the graph like this within 15 minutes. So you can get scatter plot, wall corner plot, clusterogram, and these are all web-based uh, data analysis tools that are easily available uh, there, and you can just use it and get your publication-ready graph within like 15, 20 minutes. With that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to what we just summarized what we did today is that we first we look, we, I introduced you to the microbiome, then I brought you up to the host pathogen interactions. We talked about uh, interactions. Um, then we talked about how different host defense mechanisms, and followed by we also looked at the technologies that can be used to analyze all this. We looked at two things. One is we looked at the detection of microbes using PCR based assays, and then we looked at detection of the Impact, for example, we looked at the RNA, uh, what is happening to the transcripts uh, of using RT squared PCR arrays. This is to PCR based approach to, uh, to look at our uh, uh, the different the whole all interactions. 
with that i want to open the uh, question and answer session right now uh, thank you very much everyone for listening and let me open the floor for uh, questions well, thank you very much doctor for your amazing presentation before we get started on the question and answer session i would like to remind our audience how to submit questions you can submit questions by typing them in the q and a box which can be found by clicking on the green q and a button at the lower left of the presentation window. We do have time for just a few questions here. So doctor, I do have um, a question uh, for you here. Which genes are covered in the antibiotic resistance panel? You know, th th there are about 84 plus genes that are covered in this antibiotic resistance panel. And I think what you should do is you guys should come to our uh, website, to kaijan.com, and look at the antibiotic resistance, what genes are involved. And there are many, many, uh, many of them. Uh, but the way we, it, we have done this, uh, designed this panel, so is to actually go talk to thought leaders and talk to um, to the scientists and, and from uh, based on their suggestions we decided this antibiotic resistance panel to get that list of genes i think i would strongly suggest that just come visit to our uh, visit our website of, and just type in antibiotic resistant gene panel and i think that should give you the whole list of antibiotic resistant genes thank you right, thank you yeah and our next question is going to be a what are pan ac assays Oh, okay. Uh, I think this is, uh, again, referring to uh, one of our, uh, uh, I think, the slides I showed you, wherein uh, we have, it is one of the controls um, we have, uh, pan ac assays. So when you're doing this uh, microbial uh, detection uh, studies, right, uh, so what do you have? You have a mix. You have the human cells in, the, in, your, in, your, in your sample. Then you have your, uh, maybe that's a bacterial or fungal infection there, on, or you might have a uh, um, or you might have uh, what you call as uh, uh, human cells. So there are three things. One is your, you can have a bacteria or fungi there, or you can have uh, uh, you can have the human cells, or you can have a, a pathogenic uh, uh, bacteria there. So the PAD AC assays are basically single RT-PCR tests for quantitative detection of a broad range of Aspergillus and Candela species. Candida species. So, that, uh, so basically, when you're doing your uh, identifying your uh, human uh, the cells in the PCR arrays, you have this so that if you have any uh, Aspergillus or Candida species in your sample, it, this will tell you that uh, that hey, you know, you have these uh, uh, kind of these are kind of a controls for you. Uh, that's what, uh, and that's why they are included in these, uh, uh, in, the, in, these uh, in this, in this, in cells, in these, in these assays. So, in short, uh, this uh, pan AC assays are basically a single RT PCR tests for detecting Aspergillus or Candida species in your sample. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and our next question is: What is the minimum number of samples required for the microbial DNA PCR kits? Well, wow, that's a difficult one. Um, so it depends on what you're, uh, what, what you, what you're trying to do, right? Uh, let's say, um, and also what kind of format you're trying to do. For example, let's say if you're doing, um, uh, either you can do metagenomic studies where you can directly take, uh, you're taking a uh, metagenomic sample and you're doing uh, 96, uh, let, let's say, uh, a single assay or, or single assay you're trying to do, in that case, you, are, you need about two nanograms of metagenomic DNA. But if you're using a colony, you have an isolated colony, one nanogram is enough if you're doing 384 uh, wells. Uh, so when you're doing a 384 well assay, you need about two nanograms or one nanogram. Or if you need a single uh, single assay, one assay of, in 96 wells, then you need about five to uh, five nanograms or maybe 2.5 nanograms. Um, but if you're if you're doing on a 384 well plate and you're doing multiple assays in that, then it, it, you might need 200 to or 100 nanograms. The amount of DNA or uh, sample you need depends on uh, your assay design. Um, but what we can tell you is that at our end, the sensitivity wise, we can detect up to 10, at least 10. Uh, we need about 10 uh, microbes if you are there. 10 copy number. Our system is able to detect it. And the sample requirement varies a lot depending on your sample and also depend from where you're, uh, what kind of assay you're trying to do. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, can you design custom assays? Uh, yes, uh, we can design custom assays and there are different 
kinds of custom assets you can do too. Like for one level of assay is customization is when you say, I want um, this, 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 X, uh, gene, A gene, B gene, C gene, D gene, E, and you can put, and you can design an array like that one. That is one level of array. This is customization, um, wherein you just change the composition of the play array you are trying to use. Or uh, the second level of customization, complete customization, where you say that I want to I have this sequence, um, uh, this is, uh, and I want to design an assay based on the sequence I have. Uh, so this can be a, this, this is useful, especially if you are working on novel uh, microbes where you, it's not been detected yet. It's not there. In that case, that's a very good, uh, a good, good way of, uh, uh, and you want to design your own personal. Um, custom, uh, custom assets for your custom experiments that can. So there are two levels of customization in short, yes. Thank you very much, Doctor. And we do have time for one last question. And what we have here is what is the difference between PPC control and microbial DNA control, and can they be multiplexed? Okay. Um, so now first let me go. What is the difference between PPC control and uh, DNA control? So I think this is referring to the microbial plate that somebody is talking about um, that I, I mentioned uh, earlier. So the PPC control means positive PCR control. Remember, we are talking about PCR-based assays. One of the, if you let your whole come, plate comes blank, then you don't know whether what went wrong. Uh, so for, well, the first thing you need to know is, hey, did the PCR assay work? They actually like, do the PCR work or I have some inhibitor in my system that the PCR doesn't even work. So to prevent that False, uh, false negative, uh, we have uh, positive PCR controls in all our arrays of plates. So that will enable you to do that. And second is, what is microbial DNA control? Let's say your PPC control worked, and, but uh, still, uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, so then some, nothing else worked. Um, uh, none of the other thing worked. That means it, uh, you need to make sure that if there's any microbe in, in your system, you need some sort of a control to show that your microbial PCR worked. So that is what is called microbial DNA control, where you where it's showing you, hey, you know, that's the microbial DNA uh, that, you know, uh, so we know that the, the system is able to detect a microbial, a microbial DNA. So, so these are all different ways to just to controls to show, uh, to avoid, uh, that are in, inbuilt into the system to avoid your false positives or false negatives. And I think they can they be multiplexed? That I, I assume this, this question is uh, when we are trying to uh, do multiplex, multiplex, can you do multiple, uh, multiplexing, uh, mul uh, multiple genes or multiple microbes in the same well? No, you cannot do that, especially when you do PCR based assays. Uh, you cannot multiplex them. You will actually do it one, one, it's one cell at a time or one uh, sample or one gene at a time especially for the PCR-based assays. When you go into next generation sequencing, yes, there you are what you call molecular barcoding up front. Um, uh, up front. Uh, so, so we can do multiplexing. But PCR-based assays, that's one of the disadvantages we have. And thank you very much for that, Doctor. And do you have any closing remarks for us today? Um, the closing remarks, what I would suggest is that when you're trying to design, um, uh, when you're trying to, first when you're entering this whole field of microbiome, uh, make sure that you, uh, you understand all the terminologies correctly and you've got a lot of times there's confusion there, number one. Also look at the sample, what you're looking at. When you're, uh, when you're looking at the samples, make sure you are uh, treating the samples appro appropriately. When you're collecting the samples properly, so that there's no contamination of external uh, microbes into the system. And also make sure that when you're isolating them, you're, uh, you have the appropriate uh, uh, methodologies and protocols set for that is specific for that sample. This is very critical because it's all garbage in, garbage out. So if you, because we invest a lot of time and money uh, in the downstream process, so make sure your sample preparation process is very, very strong, very clear, and you have no doubts, no uh, questions regarding the sample preparation protocol. And last is, is your detection. When you're trying to detect, uh, set your goals very clear. What are my goals? Uh, my goals are to detect the microorganism or are my goals to detect the impact of the microorganism on the human system? So what are you trying to do? So clear, set your goals clearly and design your experiments um, accordingly. Microbiome is a very excitement area. And as I said, uh, the whole, uh, whole uh, 
just thinking of using uh, how you track cancer uh, therapy uh, the same way uh, we can replace the cancer drug with the microbes and use the fact fecal transplant or viral transplant a lot of different things can be done and how we can track the impact of that on that's a very interesting area so i just am so excited about the whole micro whole microbiome project and this is just a great area to be in thank you very much thank you to everyone Um oh, thank you very much doctor um for your wonderful presentation again and I'd also like to thank our sponsor Kaigen for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for online demand viewing through December 8th. You will receive an email from Labroots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.